human-centered approach um, is really what it says. It's really looking at the work that we do through the lens of this work being a head and heart business. One of our pillars that's outlined in our strategic plan is humanized. So we focus a lot on well-being, um, the academic well-being, the social and emotional well-being, just the physical well-being of students and, and their families. We also look at this work as a community work. I can't isolate my children from their families. I can't isolate them from the community. Even as we work to bring children back to school, which I do believe that children do need to be in person, we're also balancing families who are afraid. They're afraid to bring um, their, their young people back into the school because of fear of COVID. Many of our families are frontline workers. Um, they don't have some of the protections that you and I have where we are able to more insulate ourselves from what's happening in society. We need more people that are leading with their hearts. We have a lot of smart people, but if they don't have that heart element and understanding that this is truly a human business, um, then I think we're going to fail to meet the needs of many, many of our young people. So, um, yes, I, I call myself a status quo disruptor. Um, I have been using that term for quite a while. Um, I was very much involved in the Ferguson Commission's recommendations after Mike Brown's murder. And so really looked at what was happening in St. Louis in a much more um, in-depth way. Grew up in St. Louis, know St. Louis, went to schools in St. Louis. But after Mike Brown's murder, really um, seeing a lot of the systems that are just not coordinated and are not designed to support equity for all. So Status Quo Disruptor really is about my, my, my goal and my passion for equity. So we have worked with the International Restorative Practices Institute, and so we have trained our staff on restorative practices. And really, it's just a school of thought of, of changing discipline from being this punitive thing to something that is more restorative. When we looked at our discipline, the majority of students that had the most infractions were Black boys. The next group were our Black girls. And then we began to look at what type of relationships do these young people have with adults in our schools? And we saw that there was a gap. And so restorative practices is doing things with children instead of to them, um, having conversations about why the action was inappropriate, um, what harm that action may have caused, what needs to happen to repair that harm. It's not 100%, but it certainly makes that um, relationship better when that child has to return back to that classroom where that teacher and that, that child cur curse that teacher out and they have to return back. It helps to repair that relationship. So I started this journey um, really right when I was uh, appointed as superintendent, I began partnering with the Live and Well. Um, and University City was one of the first regional, a part of the first regional collaboratives um, where we were really learning about trauma. And it really looked at the number of traumatic events that an individual had and how those events impacted their brain, how their brain is wired, how their brain functions. So the more traumatic events that a child has, the more ACEs a child has, we're seeing the impact on their brain. So I call it like if you were to shake up a soda can and you just keep shaking it, you shake it for 15 minutes. And then you give that to someone and say, open it. We know what happens, it explodes, right? So a lot of our children are coming with all of that stuff in their brains, all of those emotions, and they come to school and just a simple tap on the shoulder creates this reaction. And the there's some underlying causes for that. So instead of saying, what is wrong with you? We say, what happened to you? And so being trauma informed helps us know, again, I'm going back to the human centered approach. These are human beings. And we have to ask different questions. We have to uh, adjust our approach. Um, we have to be have more empathy and we have to be informed. So we have hired three restorative practices specialists in our district that work in tandem with our trauma-informed teams. We have school teams in every building that have been trained on trauma 
Are we perfect? Absolutely not. We have a long way to go, but we are planting those seeds so that every child is affirmed. And instead of saying it's the child ready for school, it's the school ready for the child. So we have an aspirational vision. It's called Learning Reimagined. So we have forecast what we want it to look like. Um, it consists of three pillars. Our first is humanize, where every child is affirmed, loved, valued. The teachers and adults and staff that are working with them, principals are validated for being um, the experts that they are. And they are given the autonomy to make decisions closest to children, which is in the classroom where it matters the most. We implement those practices that are restorative around discipline um, and having conversations about equity and, and racism and anti-racist practices. And it's not um, a bad thing to have those conversations, but people lean into them and see genuinely how they as educators can change the trajectory of a child because of their action. Our second pillar is personalized. We believe that education should fit like a fine tailor suit. If a child has an interest in STEM, they can explore that. If a child is an athlete, they can explore athletics. If a child wants to have a passion for helping people, we have service learning where they can understand how as a result of their efforts, that service can be a way to give back um, to the community. Also knowing that academic, we're an academic institution. So we should be able to meet the child that is high performing, the child that's middle of the road and that child that needs a lot of support. We should have those intervention supports in place to address the needs of all learners, regardless of how they show up. Our third pillar is problematized. We didn't make the word up. Um, it is really about bringing the world into the classroom and vice versa. A classroom doesn't necessarily have to have four walls. It doesn't have to be in a school. You can have school just about anywhere. So how do we expand those opportunities where children are learning outside? Um, they're experiencing learning at um, Del Monte, which is a, a plant here that focuses on food science. And they can go there and learn about the science of food science, but also see the professional aspect of it. Um, they can partner with Boeing to learn how to build these amazing planes in, as their students. Um, they can have content experts that come in to hear their presentations. We have students that have researched uh, real world issues such as food scarcity, um, water insecurity, and they have created gardens to help refugee families here in St. Louis. And the proceeds from their garden are going to these families. That is what the problematized um, pillar is about. And it really is about fundamentally, we do have social justice woven throughout it because that's what we believe in, understanding that unjust systems, even if they don't impact you, are wrong. And it is an, more an ethical responsibility to disrupt those systems. So that is what I envision. We call it learning reimagine. Um, we, we know that it's an aspirational vision, um, but I, I think that it would be something that looks very different than how school looks today. Um, I see a lot of collaboration between teachers. Um, I see doors open and, and schools being open spaces when it's safe to do so, obviously, where um, children are really able to interact with the world and make meaning of their learning. Project-based learning is another approach where they're creating projects based on standards, but based on their passion and their interest.